Greetings, I'm glad you're back. Um, we're looking at the book of Revelation. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at the hereafter portion of the book. Uh, from chapter 4 through the end of the book is the hereafter portion. However, it was only hereafter to John. Because a, numer uh, a number of these prophecies are being fulfilled in our time, uh, it's not hereafter to us. We're in the midst of it. We're in the middle of it. So, in order to understand the hereafter portion of Revelation, it's necessary to take kind of a guided tour of the Bible in, in two sections. This one I call learning the Bible crosswise. In the next section we'll look at uh, a study I call the Roadmap of the Ages and I'll introduce that at the end of this video. Now learning the Bible crosswise, what, what the heck does that mean? Well, uh, <clears throat> here's the first verse in the book of, Re of the hereafter portion of Revelation. Uh, John says, I looked, the door was open in heaven, the first verse, the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet talking to me and it said, come up here and I'm going to show you things which must be hereafter thus the hereafter portion of Revelation. Now, the first thing John sees in, in, in the verse, very next verse, he says, I was in the Spirit, and a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Uh, for literally decades before, I, uh, or after I became a Christian, uh, I would read this and just pass by it. I didn't understand what bearing it had on the prophecy. Uh, but the answer is, it, it has everything to do with it. And I'll show you why. As a matter of fact, if the book of you know prophecy is kind of, is written in sort of sort of a cipher, it's kind of in code uh, because of the parallel uh, parallelism, the metaphors, uh, the symbolic language. And to break that code, you need to understand the throne of God, and that's what we're about to uh, look at in greater depth. Now, here's a uh, I cherry pick this. This is, all, this is only part of the description of God's throne, uh, but this is the only part we're going to be focusing on. So I, of course, plucked it out now. It says there is a uh, there is these four living creatures before the throne of God. Uh, God is in the midst of these four living creatures, so they're flanking God on, on on the four sides. Now here's the they were like a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. Okay. Now, so if you take the throne of God, it's sort of visualize this. Uh, put the throne of God in the middle, and you're going to put these four living creatures uh, surrounding God's throne. Now, why did I put it? put them at those particular positions. Uh, we'll find that out in just a second. Uh, be patient for right now. They are in the correct place. And that, of course, is a cross. Now, here's the first verse in the Bible. And uh, if you take it apart, you can structure it the same way. Um, but this is me constructing it. It's that the Bible doesn't say to put it in this way. I just thought it was interesting that it can be put in this way. Now, God is the subject of the sentence. So let's put God in the middle. Now, in the beginning is the first verse, uh, created is the verb, let's put that in, it's in the correct order. The heavens are up, the earth is down. Uh, the actual uh, phrasing in Hebrew is, in the beginning created God the heavens and the earth. And we'll get to that in a subsequent study way down the road. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, these four things. In the beginning is a reference to time. It's, um, and it's uh, not unfair uh, to say the heavens are correspond to space, we call that when we look up in the heavens, we say, "Oh, that's outer space." So we do refer to it as that. Uh, created is, of course, a verb that implies the expenditure of energy, and of course, the earth is comprised of matter. So we have time, space, matter, and energy, and God, the prime mover, the engineer, the designer of all creation. So uh, we we have the same four part partition as the as the throne of God, but. You might say, oh, gee, you went to a lot of trouble to contrive that. That's your own construct. It does, the Bible doesn't at all say that. Yeah, but I thought it was kind of neat. And if you're uh, any kind of objective Christian, I'm hoping you'll think it's pretty neat, too. And that's a cross, of course. Now, Genesis 2. Now, Genesis 2 is all about the uh, Garden of Eden. It says that a river came out of the garden. I'm sorry. Let's go back a step. It doesn't say that. It says a river came out of Eden and watered the garden. And from there it divided into four heads. The Pison flowed into the land of Havilah. The Hittichel went eastward into the land of Assyria. The Gihon into, the, into Ethiopia. And the Parath, that's uh, the Hebrew the, in the Greek. And in most Bibles it says the Euphrates. Now, so of course, you can see right now before I even put it on the screen, that's, that's a cross. Uh, I don't think I have any more comments to say about that. Now, this is where you're going to see why I placed the living creatures around the throne of God in the order that I did. Uh, the marching order in the, in the wilderness, there were four principal tribes uh, of Israel that had what's called a standard in the Bible. 
Uh, now a standard is thought to be a just a pole or a staff with a flag or a banner on, uh, on it with the ensign or uh, image uh, for, for that tribe on it. And they were to camp or march around something called the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was something God had Moses commission the building of. And it was like a portable temple. It's where there was an altar of sacrifice and there was other furniture there that um, it was like a, it was the focal point of their worship. And uh, the tribe of Levi, the, the priestly tribe, uh, was responsible for all uh, aspects of the temple, uh, constructing it, deconstructing it, carrying it, uh, whatnot. And of course, <clears throat> the uh, Reuben, uh, on Reuben's standard was the man, and he was to, to camp and march south of the tabernacle. Ephraim with the standard of the ox on the west, Dan north of the tabernacle, and Judah on the east. Now this is what, see the, uh, now you understand why I placed the images around the throne of God uh, in the positions that I did. Uh, and of course, that's a cross. Now here uh, are the two other tribes. Each one of these principal tribes was accompanied by two other tribes, and here they are just to complete the study. And of course, Levi cared for uh, the tabernacle and everything there. So anyway, uh, there's a cross. Now Adam's dominion, Adam was given dominion over the fish of the sea, the beast of the field, the fowl of the heavens, and the creeping things on the earth. And that's, of course, a cross, uh, the stars of the heavens. Now, if um, from the point, from the place of Adam's dominion on the earth, as the earth revolves on its axis around the sun, uh, there is a longest day of the year we know as the summer solstice, the shortest day of the year we know as the winter solstice, and the spring and vernal equinox are midway between. And as we look out at the night sky from these four positions around the sun, we see different constellations. As a matter of fact, if a mariner had the date and the correct time, he could extrapolate where on earth he was based on what constellations appear uh, in the night sky. And that's how navigation was done before, uh, actually not long ago. GPS is a recent thing. So anyway, let's go on. Now, Aquarius the water bear, why did I throw this in? I just thought this was a neat study because both astronomy and astrology agree we are entering into uh, the age of Aquarius. You know, as we move through uh, the galaxy, the, 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 um, uh, the constellations change slightly uh, from decade to decade and from century to century. And as we enter into this age of Aquarius, um, the constellations in the four quadrants of the heavens will be uh, Pisces, Taurus, Aquila, and Scorpio. And those, are the, those correspond to the animals that are the categories of animals Adam was given dominion over. And I just thought that was significant because whereas Adam was given dominion over this earth and his dominion was limited to this earth, uh, when Christ returns to rule, uh, he's the son of God and of course he is heir of all things. And so he will have dominion not just not over so, solely the earth, but over the entire creation. And so the seat of his dominion being Adam's former seat, the, uh, the earth, and of course the scope of his dominion will be all things. And I just thought that was cool that, uh, that these constellations will be in the solstice and solstices and equinoxes when that age arrives, the kingdom age soon to come. All right, that's across. Now, um, we looked at um, space, uh, the four-part division based on the solstices and equinoxes. We looked at matter, and in other words, we looked at the earth and the four-part uh, division with the garden in the center and the four rivers and four lands. Uh, I had originally worked up a little study on energy, uh, but I I'm not a scientist. I don't claim to be. I'm, uh, and I, I looked at my little presentation when I got done, and I thought, Gee, that's dumb. So, so I didn't include it. I wanted to make it a well-rounded thing by going into all four places, but I couldn't. So the final one is time, and that's the whole purpose of this little study. Uh, when, we're going to get to time, I believe, in our next study, when we study the roadmap of the ages, and we're going to see how God has indeed divided the ages of time appointed to Adam's dominion. Um, we're going to see how it follows the, the pattern of God's throne. Uh, I think there's one more slide here. Yeah, here it is. Now, the temple is a fascinating 
uh, construct. God gave the plans to build the temple uh, to David, but he pro prohibited David from building it uh, because of, he said, David was a man of blood. And uh, if you look at when God told him that and what he had ju done just previous to that, uh, they had just conquered the Ammonites and they were, uh, they engaged in a little blood sport. And uh, uh, it looks very much like uh, they were indeed um, enjoying the blood, blood lust. Uh, I mean, they were casting people off of cliffs and, you know, uh, doing other things. I, uh, I don't recall exactly the specifics. You might want to look it up. But anyway, it was Solomon, David's uh, son, and the, his heir to the throne, that actually took the resources that David had gathered and uh, the plans that David had gotten from God, and it constructed the temple. Now, the temple is... Uh, basically has four precincts, uh, the court of the Gentiles, the court of the Jews, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And it sort of serves as an outline of the ages appointed to this creation. Uh, the court of the Gentiles, uh, the first age, it pertains to the first, first age. Um, court of the Jews, that period of time that uh, the focus of the Bible is on the Jews. Uh, the holy place, you know, we'll get to that when we get there. What I want to call to your attention now is if the temple is a road map of the ages, so to speak, then uh, the, the centerpiece of the temple would be something that speaks of, of that which is divine. Remember, in all these four-part models in this Learning the Bible Crosswise uh, study, the centerpiece was always something divine. Uh, the throne of God in the center of the four living creatures, the... Um, Gosh, what else did we look at now? I can't even think. Oh, yeah, the Garden of God in the center. Uh, the earth, the seat of Adam's dominion in the center of the, of the uh, solstices and equinoxes. And everyone, there's something something divine, something holy in the center. And, the, and this is no different. You see, the, um, the altar, the altar of sacrifice, is just before the porch, and it's separated by a staircase because the porch was higher elevation. And so if the, if the altar... Is the speaks of the time on the, on the timeline as when Christ was crucified. Then the staircase represents the ascension of Christ, and the porch would represent heaven. And it's referred to in the New Testament as the pinnacle of the temple. Uh, when Satan tempted Christ, he said, uh, "You know, can't, he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, cast yourself down, for it is said, God will give charge over thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone.'" Uh, and, of course, Christ uh, didn't go for it. He said, Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. So if the pinnacle represents, uh, if the porch of the temple represents heaven, then, of course, we expect to see the proportions given in the Bible to be very high. And, of course, they are. Some commentators actually dismiss them as being disproportionately high. And they and it probably wasn't, wasn't that high, wasn't built that high. I think it was, actually. I think it was... Uh, uh, one of the wonders of the world when it existed back at the time of Solomon and, and thereafter. Kind of a shame it was destroyed by uh, uh, the empires when they uh, conquered. Anyway, that's our final slide, I believe, and we are done. The next up, the uh, Roadmap of the Ages. Uh, God bless. I hope you join me as we continue in our look on the book of Revelation. Y'all have a good day.